Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Community Marriage Initiative Fund's monthly training event. My name is Katie Ray. I'm with Marriage Initiative, and I have the privilege of working closely with our amazing CMI teams across the U.S. as they connect with other marriage champions and really serve couples with intentional purpose in their respective communities. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. But before we begin, I always like to kind of do a quick recap of our previous month's event for those of you who, who weren't able to join us. So in the month of November, we had the honor of hosting Mark Ellis, and I don't think Mark is with us today, but Mark is with the Central Arkansas Marriage Initiative, or CAMI, as a lot of us know their initiative by, and he spoke on not only fundraising and donor relations, but really getting to know your donors on a deeper level. And he shared a list of questions to, to really think about and answer before meeting with donors, questions revolving around their special interests and goals, as well as their business background. So it really allows you as a CMI to kind of take a deeper dive into who these individuals are and, and really get to, to know them even, even before approaching them. So it was re really neat to hear from him. We also hosted Paul Kuhn and Saul Scaff with the Austin Marriage Initiative as they presenting, presented on building relationships with churches and walked us through their strategic process that they've created, which helps them follow, you know, kind of a particular process and really helps them to be fully prepared before they connect and communicate with churches. We also had Dave Jackson with Friends of the Family Ministries in Corvallis, Oregon, share information on mission increase and how the free tool can kind of help our CMIs take first steps in approaching fundraising and donor relations. And Mission Increase has so many free resources available, such as templates and, and workshops to kind of help you get started. Um, and it even allows you to, they can even connect you with a regional director in your area so that you can ask more specific questions. Mr. Carl Caton speak on building marriage ministries in churches by kind of bringing people together at round at roundtable events, which I know a lot of our CMIs are are starting to to um, to think about hosting roundtable events in their communities. So it was a really a really wonderful event, and and as you guys know, you can go and watch it on our YouTube event. Uh, I'm sorry, on our YouTube page, they're all there. I think starting back in May of this year, they're all posted there. And moving on to today's agenda, um, before I introduce our first speaker, we're actually going to have Ms. Kim Kwame in Tacoma, Washington, and she will be opening us up in prayer. So Kim, whenever you're ready. Oh, dear Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that you are who you are, that you are sovereign. And I just, this is a month where we get to reflect on the birth of Jesus, Lord, and the hope that he brings. And so, Lord, I just thank you that we get to do that. And what a privilege to be able to be here with all of us to learn and grow and how to strengthen marriages in our communities, Lord. And so I pray a special blessing over the speakers today. And um, Lord, thank you for what we are going to hear today about what they have to share um, and what they've learned about strengthening marriages and families in their area and how that can be something we can benefit from, Lord. We thank you for that. And um, I just thank you for the privilege for getting to come together to share with one another. And I thank you for um, Carl and Katie that they lead this out, that we have a training opportunity each month um, in order to come together and um, learn more. So bless this time that we have today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kim. And I sent out the agenda earlier today, and initially we had Jeff going first and then Sheila, but I don't think Jeff is quite with us yet. So I wanted to see if, if we could do Sheila first. Is that is that all right with you, Sheila? Okay. That'd be fine. Yeah, That'd wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Sheila Weber is with us today. And to give you a little more information about Sheila, Sheila is the co-founder of National Marriage Week and has served as its executive director for most of its mission. Sheila has been a guest on more than 500 radio and TV shows nationwide 
and was also a president scholar of New York University, where she wrote her master's thesis on the role of public policy on the dissolution of marriage culture. So thank you, being, thank you for being here with us today, Sheila. Great to be here. I, I had to laugh because I'm in New York City and you guys were talking about the weather. I'm very grateful. I'm going to be in Austin, Texas for Christmas and New Year. So, oh, well, the there you go. So, anyway, yep. that's where my daughter and her family now lives. That's right. So, warmer weather, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this is really perfect timing for, for us to, to have you here today because National Marriage Week is just right around the corner in early February, starting on February 7th. And we are excited here at Save Me, and we know that our CMIs are, are getting geared up as well. So, <clears throat> so Sheila, I'd like to really start today by asking you to tell us a little bit about the mission of, of National Marriage Week. I know, you know the majority of our CMIs know about National Marriage Week. But for those mm -hmm. of us who, who, may, who may not know, you know about its mission and its inner workings, could you kind of give us a little more information about that? Sure, and I'll try to do the fast track history on this. Uh, well, there are 22 marriage weeks around the world in, in 22 countries uh, have marriage week celebrated. And we began um, our particular effort, which is National Marriage Week USA in 2010. Diane Soli, when she ran Smart Marriages did did um, elevate Marriage Week, uh, but then that shut down. And um, I, I ran it uh, since 2010. Last year, we had a woman named Erin Stevens uh, run it just for the last uh, session, which was um, last February. Um, and our whole goal is to create a movement, provide a clearinghouse, have a campaign, and offer a source of help, which is is distinctive from uh, there's so many amazing, wonderful marriage workshops and curricula and marriage providers all across America. We wanted to create a place where everybody could sing off the same song page one time a year and that we could all join forces one time a year in hopes that the nation would, uh, we could get the attention of the nation So when I say a movement, I mean that we want, there are four goals. So we want to stir a movement of marriage education, which many of you, of course, are doing. Uh, but we want to increase that movement and motivate more and more uh, entities, particularly churches, to, to start um, providing marriage courses. Secondly, a clearinghouse. We have the, an online national calendar where anybody all across the country can post any class or workshop at any time of year. And we'd like that to be more well-known and more utilized. And it's a campaign. I like to use the analogy of Earth Day. Earth Day started in the 1970s. Um, and today, there are more than two, two billion acts of green around the world. So they have spurred these uh, local acts of cleaning up the environment. And so it's, but it's a campaign with a larger message, and which is what National Marriage Week hopes to do is to provide a national message that marriage is worth it. And then to, to stir all these local um, ways of supporting marriage. And then lastly, a source of help so that our website, Facebook, and all the other social media um, entities can provide places uh, for people to get the help they need. So that's a short history. Um, and I, um, sadly, my husband passed away in August, and I am just not, um, I'm so, so grateful that Carl Caton and his team are bringing all their talents to now focus this January and February on National Marriage Week. I have um, other things that I have to focus on these days, and I just, I just think very highly of, of Carl and, and all of you that are joining on this call. So I'm very grateful. Well, thank you, Sheila. And, and I know you, you touched about this in, in your previous answer, but how does having a special week set aside for solely celebrating marriage help us raise awareness around marriage in each of our respective communities here on the call? Well, um, in the past, we had a, a gathering in the halls of Congress and 
And I've been on uh, much, a lot of national television and national radio. So to have that one week a year can help you with some elevated attention in those ways. There are states where leaders have put forth a governor's proclamation about the benefits of marriage and proclamation to institute National Marriage Week. And there are mayor's proclamations and that sort of thing. Um, we've had various people create a PSA and you can get a free 15 second spot or a 60 second spot. Um, and you can, there, there are a lot of things that we can do collectively. Um, and I, I only had um, one or two helpers. So I am very excited about the fact that there's a larger team who actually can make all these things happen on a larger scale. And so I, I think it's time for National Marriage Week to get to the next level. Absolutely. And, and now that we, you know, or our audience kind of understands a little more about, about National Marriage Week, let's talk about the, the different ways to gain publicity. You, you, you know, you've been able to get some really good public exposure on TV and newspapers and on the radio. So tell us how you, you know, have built certain relationships which have helped National Marriage Week open those doors. Yes, well, I happen to live in New York City and that um, is helpful for national media because it really is about relationship. And so my husband and I spoke in a marriage class and somebody sitting there um, asked me to write a commentary and that ended up becoming on Fox Online. And so I wrote commentaries for 10 years, which print media will drive the, the radio and, and television. So if somebody sees it in print, then you'll get phone calls. Um, but local media is really a great thing to focus on since you all are, are focused on your city. And so there are several things that can be done. Um, and I would start in early to mid-January. I'm sorry about that doorbell. <laughs> anyway, uh, early to mid-January, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to tell them to just leave this package. I'm, forgive me. This is a private home. No worries at all. As this I always say, the joy underneath. of working of uh, you know Zoom and being able to work from home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a private home, and no I worries. can't really just drop it on my doorstep. Um, so um, coverage. Uh, you might be friendly with a leader in your town, um, who maybe is the president of a, a manufacturing corporation. And, and maybe they take out radio ads and they can call the radio station and say, hey, we love that this group, um, your community marriage initiative is going to be hosting all these classes uh, what is called during what is called National Marriage Week. Could you have somebody um, be interviewed on one of your talk shows? Now, sometimes they'll give you three minutes and sometimes they'll give you 30 minutes. Um, and we'll talk about you know, how you can truncate your message and expand it. Um, but um, you also can, um, if you have a local penny saver or you can go to all the churches. We, we used to have on our website, but you, uh, we sent all this, it's in the back end, of what used to be on the old website, bulletin inserts. Churches can put bulletin inserts in their pews that week. They just download them and print them and then attach at the bottom the, the, the place and the time where a local class might be happening near that church. Um, in terms of getting the coverage, um, you're really, you know, we also used to have, again, this is something we can get to you, but a, a formula for a press release where you just fill in the blanks. And, um, but you can find a journalism major, a student journalism student or somebody in your, in your sphere of influence who maybe has had a background in writing um, and not just, um, it would have to be journalistic writing who knows how to write a good hook and a good lead um, and, and you know put out a press release, actually pick up the phone. So the first place to start is to pick up the phone of your local editor of your newspaper. I would do that the first week of January and say, you know we're, we're a couple of weeks out on this. We'd love to have you cover uh, the fact that we're doing all these things in our town on behalf of marriage. And uh, you can pick up the phone and call a local news talk radio. 
So um, that's a start. And then I don't know if we want to get into looking for what is newsworthy. And you're looking for something out of the ordinary. So I, I would call it a hook, a news hook. And it could be that you discover that there's this wonderful couple that's having their 70th wedding anniversary in your town. And they are very articulate and maybe they could give you, they could give others five tips of what they've learned over 70 years, five tips of how to have a better marriage. And then you write a commentary or you get the newspaper to come interview that couple and ask that it be highlighted on behalf of National Marriage Week. You sort of have to keep reminding people that we're, between us, we're trying to build the name recognition of Marriage Week. It, it's very easy, of course, to use Valentine's Day um, as that calendar time, but um, you know, Valentine's covers a lot of kinds of relationships. So that's why we try to keep the focus on, on marriage by reminding people that this is a special time once a year. Um, you could also uh, use new research and data. For example, if you're using a curriculum in your city um, and you happen to have data on, you know, 95% of the couples that have gone through this curriculum are, have feel, feel more secure and feel happier and content in their marriage after taking this course, that can become your, your news hook. That can be right up there in the, in the lead of your paragraph saying 95% of, of couples that take the course that's being offered in Dayton, Ohio, um, you know, two years later are still together. Whatever that data shows, and you can go back to the curriculum provider, they might have the data, or if you've been doing some tracking yourself when you held courses, if you have a satisfaction checkoff and you have some, something really positive to show, that can be a news hook. Um, I'm just looking here to see if I had something else written down. Um, as I said, it, it, it helps to contact print by the second week of January and work on a story or a commentary. If you have a marriage expert in your community, they could write a commentary and it gets put into the opinion section of your local paper. So those are some ideas. Thank you, Sheila. That is, that is wonderful, wonderful advice. And really good articles that, that you've submitted to, to, to a media outlet. And that good article, that great article ended up leading to an interview. So tell us a little more about, about that process and, and how it works. Yes, well, you would, you would want to place, ideally, you'd like to place something in print on February 6th, and then it says tomorrow starts National Marriage Week, because that, that gives a little time. Uh, and then you call, you immediately call the radio station the next day and say, oh, by the way, did you see that article that was in the newspaper or that commentary and uh, or you can call the the radio stations in the second week of January which is, would be a good idea also and then they will tell you send me something so if you reach you know if you pick up the phone and you reach the news editor or they might tell you the features editor whatever the, um, the section have a conversation about what you're doing and why National Marriage Week is important. You can look at the homepage on the website and get a few talking points. Um, we have a one page fact sheet. Some of these things uh, used to be on the website and last year I stepped back and um, a lot of them were removed from the website. I think maybe um, they were, have been provided to Deanna and Carl's team and uh, we could, have a conversation about a few of the tools could be put back um, if, if people find that they're helpful to have access to. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is um, picking up the phone. Sometimes you might have a leader that loves the work you're doing and they're well known, or they happen to be a huge patron of the local university. And they would be willing to write or author of the commentary or have you write it and they attach their name to it, sort of espousing the work you do. 
Uh, it could be a couple that was literally on the brink of divorce and they, you can help them write a short commentary on why their marriage was turned around. Thank you, Sheila. And, and you mentioned, or I, I mentioned earlier in, in introducing you that you have been a guest on, on more than 500 TV and radio shows. So I'm sure, you know, you've been in a situation where the unexpected happens and the host, you know, may throw you a curveball. So how, how do you handle those situations? And I promise I won't, I won't throw you any curveballs today. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's good. This is, this is our group of insiders. We can talk about these curveballs. Um, well, uh, the obvious one is gay marriage. And before gay marriage was legal, I would even get emails asking our position on it. And at the time, I would simply say, well, um, that's not our issue. We're focused on helping marriages have more success because we want to reduce poverty and we want to benefit children. And, and in fact, uh, the loss of marriage, the decline of marriage um, greatly impoverishes women. and it. Uh, causes all kinds of future troubles for children. And so we don't focus, um, I just deflect on the gay marriage issue and say what we do focus on. Now, this day and age, I would say, well, that is, that is still not our focus. Um, marriage, uh, gay marriage is the law of the land, and we probably have people who participate in marriage week who have differing views on the subject. But we still focus on making sure that marriages get the help that they need and to realize that there is hope uh, for recovery, even for people who feel like they're at risk. I will say one other, one other little um, sort of issue that can, can be, um, it throw you a curveball is that we also want to not make anybody feel guilty. So when somebody says, gosh, uh, you know, you're promoting marriage, but what about the fact that I've already been divorced or people in my family have been divorced twice? And I'll just say, we're not here to make anybody feel guilty. We really want people to find more success. And we're human, people have made mistakes, but then there are people who recover and they, they have a, a great marriage the second time around and, and we want to see more success. So we're not here to make anybody feel guilty, but. Uh, to bring support to people. Absolutely, that makes sense and brings some clarity to, to you know, those situations where we do find it. You know, which direction do we go, or how do we answer things? So, so thank you, thank you for that. And before before we finish today, I wanted to see if we could could briefly talk about how to get an official proclamation from, say, a mayor or a legislator or, or maybe even the governor's office. What steps can our community leaders take to, to go about doing that? Well, first of all, um, I, I just checked the website this morning and because I was I took a back seat last year. Um, I've just learned that um, the mayor and the governor's proclamation is no longer on the website. However, I'm recommending, um, Carl, you can take notes, that, that you and your team maybe put it back under the toolkit. Um, they're also in the back end of the old website was um, the, the um, sample press release that you could sort of fill in the blanks. Um, but once you have that really beautifully crafted, we already have one written, you can take that, um, that document, and again, it goes to contacts, I think. Um, very often you'll have friends who, who happen to have a, a connection with the mayor's office or the governor's office. Um, and just start early, you know, start a few weeks ahead of time and provide uh, that friend or that contact, or maybe you know your, your local state assembly person or state senator, and, and say, we would love it if the governor could make a proclamation for February 7th to the 14th. And it really helps if we, if we can get you the, the actual language. And then, um, you know, it just takes um, maybe making some phone calls and doing some emails and trying to open those doors 
But obviously, uh, some people have uh, special relationships in these areas, and that would be the way to go. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you for that, Sheila. And I wish we had time for, for more questions, but you have just given us so much, um, you know, just a wealth of knowledge today. And we thank you for being here. And I know that many of our partner cities here today are planning to become involved if they haven't already in the past with National Marriage Week coming up soon. So we're all looking forward to, to the month of February. So, so thank you again, Sheila. I, I'm sorry, I just had one last thing. Uh, you know, if somebody on this team wants to create a 15 second public service announcement, it's so easy just to record it. And it, it can be so simple, you know, just uh, February 7th to the 14th is National Marriage Week. And in your local town of Dayton, Ohio, there are, you know, eight courses to help have a better marriage. Go to and then get the link. So somebody can record an easy 15 second public service announcement and call your local stations. And um, I, you know, I, that's not a, not a difficult thing to do. Wonderful, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to our next speaker, we have Mr. Jeff Kemp. And to give you a little information about Jeff, Jeff is a quarterback for the family so to speak, as, a, as an, uh, an NFL quarterback from 1981 to 1992. He and his father, Jack Kemp, who is the former vice presidential candidate and secretary of housing of urban development, they were the first of only six sets of father-son NFL quarterbacks. And after his 11-year career in the NFL, Jeff founded and led the Seattle-based nonprofit called Stronger Families, which was dedicated to helping families thrive. And after 18 years as a CEO, Jeff and his wife, Stacy, transitioned to serve family life as a vice president and catalyst from 2012 to 2017, where they were helping leaders and influencers strengthen families. Jeff has served at the Marriage Commission, the Father Commission, and was a senior fellow for the Marriage and Family Foundation. Jeff received a bachelor's degree in economics from Dartmouth College, as well as an MBA with honors from Pepperdine University. Jeff and his wife, Stacy frequently spend time with newly married couples as in excuse me, as encouragers and mentors. And they are also featured as speakers at Family Life's Weekend to Remember. Jeff is also the author of Facing the Blitz and is passionate about helping men find their identity and purpose. So Jeff, thank you for joining us here today. We are so honored to have you speak in front of our audience of community marriage leaders. And whenever you're ready, you have our attention. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. And thanks, uh, Carl and team, for inviting me. I love the marriage initiative, um, the local focus of the San Antonio um, marriage initiative that I got to know well with Carl years ago, and then the super spirit of serving other communities, understanding that uh, it's going to take on the DNA in their community. There isn't a cookie cutter. There's not a formula. Uh, there's the Holy Spirit. And there's uh, the unique team of people in each of your cities. And yet there's great friendship and coaching from the Marriage Initiative. And uh, I really love the humble spirit and the you know, commitment to excellence, um, the movement and unity and teamwork focus. And uh, it's a blessing to get to follow Sheila, who represents all that and has done such a fabulous job creating something for everyone. Um, my dad used to say that a rising tide lifts all the boats. And I think he was quoting uh, a President Kennedy at, at that. I'm sure Jesus maybe even said that before him, because every good idea comes from God. Um, but Sheila, great job. It's great to see your face. Um, it makes me pray for you and your kids and your great family who were loved so well by the amazing um, and wild and unique B.J. Weber, who represented Jesus so well and did ministry so well with you. Uh, at New York Fellowship. Um, so keep Sheila in your prayers. Fortunately, her faith in BJ's was so big that he's he's completed the race. He's he's achieved the goal. He's at the place he's supposed to be. And the rest of us 
uh, need to look at life with that sort of attitude that that's where we're going. So all our problems and, uh, you know, detours here on earth are really not a problem. But like Paul said, um, to live is Christ and getting to show him and declare him and love him. And marriage is a beautiful way uh, to show and declare and, and prove him, especially if you read Ephesians, where it talks about the mystery of God's love for us, the church and um, husband and wife. And that bond of marriage represents that um, in God's eyes. And we need to do it well in society's eyes. Uh, Sheila did a great job and does a great job. And it's fun to see the marriage initiative carry on her um, legacy with that you know, painting the great picture of marriage and giving people that rising tide upon which to ride as we try to drill down and help one couple at a time, one husband at a time, one wife at a time, one to-be husband at a time, one to-be wife at a time, uh, one divorced person who's shaming themselves and doesn't know that God forgives every sin and every background and can use it to build a great future. And there may be a, a real marriage ministry for that divorced person or single person um, in the future, as well as maybe another marriage. So we'll see. Um, let me pray. Father God, thanks for um, this group of people. I pray that you'd help them to hear exactly what you want them to hear and then depend upon you to act upon it. Because information and inspiration uh, without experience and application is frustration. But we need you to give us the application, the follow through, the guidance uh, and the action so that we can be transformed and we can help transform others. Uh, we want to see transformation. And I pray that what I'd say would agree with your word, point to Jesus and uh, honor marriage and be helpful to these folks in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, Sheila, wave at me. I, I, I get to see you like this and great job. Uh, I apologize for flipping the order of things, but I, I'm much more comfortable, Sheila, as the backup, you know, the second uh, stringer to, to someone like you. So uh, I'll, I'll let you be the Tom Brady and, and I can be the, the backup following you. Um, let me just say that I've felt that my calling throughout life has been to teamwork and Football and my family and my dad and his leadership um, on behalf of the whole country, not just a party or a group of people or a part of the nation, um, has always given me the vision for the whole. And um, in that sense, I've been kind of called to a marriage movement and a fathering movement and a manhood movement, um, all of which tie together. Um, and would fall underneath the kingdom of God and the growth of the church movement. Uh, that one we know is succeeding. Um, 12 friends of Jesus, um, one had to be a replacement, um, who became his friends and who became great friends of one another and then went out in twos as teams um, and certainly twos and threes and fours eventually. Um, that has changed the world. And that is how the kingdom grows and the movement grows. So uh, I don't know if there's a marriage movement. Obviously, demographically, we may not see it. I don't know if there's a fatherhood movement. Um, we haven't seen a, a, a huge turnaround in the deficit of fathering uh, or a, a men's movement that spreads manhood like Jesus and fatherhood like Father God. Um, but we want there to be such, and that's what we're speaking of. And what you all are committed to and it's got to be local and it's even got to go down to one-on-one -on -one, uh, and it will depend upon the spirit of god and our humility um, not just on our strategies certainly so uh i don't know how much background you want I, I think maybe what i'll do is jump straight katie into five principles that stronger families practiced in our maybe close to decade and a half of facilitating, supporting, uh, sparking community marriage initiatives. And we were basing them around something called a, uh, a, uh, um, a community marriage agreement. And going back to Mike McManus, uh, Fourth Presbyterian Church in DC and the Modesto Community Marriage 
uh, um, policy. We called the ones that we were fit, um, facilitating community marriage agreements because they didn't all fit the exact same blueprint. We wanted them to be more widely accepted and owned. So we let them shape them and they were their agreement. They weren't a policy that we dictated from what happened great in Modesto. I honor Mike um, and Harriet for phenomenal work at that. Dennis Stoika has been central to the understanding and some of the research and some of the communication and certainly investing in this. Um, and San Antonio you know, Marriage Initiative is a piece of that. And now the marriage initiative spreading it. Uh, but I, I was at Stronger Families from 93 to 2010 and then worked for the marriage uh, commission and the um, marriage and family initiative, which was the philanthropic effort of Bubba Cathy and Scott Beck and some of the folks um, that are behind um, the marriage collective these days. Um, and then I went to family life. But here's what was refreshed in my memory by talking to Luke Nelson, uh, who was central in the community marriage initiatives that we worked on in the Northwest, mostly Washington State, um, also in Oregon, a little bit in Idaho. Okay, and so here's five principles that we applied as we were going into a community and looking for some folks who might want to do this or were already doing it, and then bringing a much bigger team together and helping them with the vision, some of the structure, some of the strategies and tactics the funding, uh, the media, the partnership of different sectors of culture, realizing that the church isn't just the pastors and the nonprofits, it's the believers in Jesus that are newscasters at Channel 7 and entrepreneurs and folks who write software and police and school and athletes and entertainers um, doctors and psychologists, and to bring some of those people with their gifting from their secular positions, and yet their faith together is what makes for a great community initiative and community marriage initiative in particular. Um, so here are the principles. Number one is ownership. The way we do our work has to grant ownership to the whole team. And this is a team we're building that are all on their own teams. They're already on their own church team. They're already on their own nonprofit team. They're, are, they're already on their own um, preventing domestic violence um, or preventing teen pregnancy or giving women options to a, a, a abortion. Um, they're already on their own team and they have a lot of commitment to that team. So unless you something that makes them motivated that ties into the mission they're already working on, you're really not going to get true participation and long-term uh, sustainability. So ownership um, is crucial. And here are some of the ways we did it. We showed four patterns of community marriage agreements rather than just one. And we said, you guys determine what's best for this community. Maybe one of these four will move you along. Then we made them shape the policy themselves. We gave them the coaching and the help. And we said, okay, what kind of agreement do you want? What do you want to be in it? Um, how super strong do you want it to be? Or not so strong that it doesn't chase away all the churches when we make an agreement, what marriage preparation standards we're gonna, we're gonna hold people to. Um, so, you know, is it gonna be super biblical or is it just gonna be based on principles so we can get a broader group of people involved? Um, so that created ownership. Um, and we also made sure that one big church or entity wasn't the initiating or primary attention getter, because that'll make other, quote, competing or smaller entities not want to participate. So it's really an equal partnership, and every individual leader has a seat at the table and it's not determined by the size of their ministry or how many people go to their church, okay? There's not much like that in America today that treats people equal and isn't a respecter of men, but I think we need to do that. Um, now there's great 
significant sometimes when you use a significant leader or a large ministry or a large church for an event or something because it creates a lot of momentum. But you got to be very careful not to create um, a they're the star of this show and we're all tagging along uh, component to it. All right. Um, so and it's also key that they own the community marriage agreement, um, which is basically, I think you all know, um, an agreement amongst the clergy and the folks doing marriage marriages, like wedding people, uh, that they will not just uh, get them married, but they will prepare them for a lifelong marriage. And that they will do some mentoring and some training and be there afterwards. Um, and we really want to monopolize the market in that community so that anyone who goes to a church knocks on the door and says, hey, can we get married next week? They hear, hey, we'd love to marry you, but we have to prepare you really well so you succeed and thrive for the long term. And they'll hear the same thing from the churches next door. And then we also want to cast the vision that you would not want to avoid go going to a church because you're going to get so much benefit that gives you much more benefit to your marriage relationship in the future. So number one was ownership. Uh, let them create their own organization, their own version of their community marriage agreement. Uh, they shape it and you help them. Um, and all the groups are equals. Number two is the Philippian principle. Um, and going to Philippi, uh, Paul said, hey, we're looking for people that are already worshiping the Lord and meeting together and praying. So we go into a community looking for those that are already meeting together, already praying because prayer has a, a true spirit of humility and unity, which is what's needed, uh, find that group and then join them and on their timing say, hey, can I share some vision um, that may be helpful for your unity and expressing some of the things you've been praying about for years for this community. And then you share the vision of a revival of marriages, that community becoming a, a world-class great place to get married and raise a family. Um, and you do it first with the people that have the most stake because they've been praying the longest. Um, so we'd go in, we'd hold a forum for them, float the idea, let them brainstorm about the idea, let them critique it and chew on it. Don't just sell. Um, ask them their heart and their vision and fit your marriage work into their prior heart and vision, which is the same thing you need to do at visiting with a pastor of a church. Um, so connect to their prayers and their ideas and their vision. So that's the Philippian principle. That's who to go to first. Um, third is you need to find and develop and be sure that there's a true uh, contact point and administrative leader for this community marriage initiative. Many of you are that person. So cool, you've got it. Um, we found that a pastor or ministry leader who was super busy with their church or their present ministry wasn't the best leader. A business person can be great because they get a lot done. Or an ex-pastor who has great relationships with a bunch of the pastors and also has some denominational credibility where he can cross some of the 31 flavors of Christianity um, and, you know, work with the Catholics and work with the Charismatics and work with the, Pro the Presbyterians and, and work with the, um, you know, the Assemblies of God down the road. Um, so a former pastor can be great, but they have to have the time and bandwidth to devote to it. And an active pastor sometimes can't, can't do that as easily. Um, and so you're looking for a person with great level five leadership. Level five from good to great, Jim Collins. Um, two characteristics. The first is great and true humility that values others above, above self, that doesn't need to get the credit, that can wash feet like Jesus, uh, and gives off a spirit that brings people together not just a magnetic personality, which may fuel pride. And number two, a great leader um, is doggedly committed and focused and persistent on the essential strategy and stays on it. Think about Herb Keller of Southwest Airlines 
he stayed focused on one simple core strategy and it made them the only profitable airline in the whole industry and only airplane that you really had a, got to enjoy a couple of chuckles on the flight instead of being all bummed out that these people are bossing you around like a bunch of infantiles. So level five leadership makes a difference, okay? And look for someone like that or ask Jesus to turn you into someone like that if you're already the leader. Um, Charlie Gessler in, in North Portland was great. Tom and Liz Dressler of Every Marriage Matters in Clackamas County, Southern Portland. So humble. They're doing it today in their 80s. They've been doing it for 20 years. Um, their community had an absolutely excellent, self-developed community marriage agreement. They held two events a year to unify everyone again every year and revitalize the team to be visible. It gave them something that Sheila would have written press press releases on and all sorts of fun media stuff um, so that there's more public attention for marriage. Um, and their community saw a 21% drop um, in divorce uh, rates over the first five years, and they've sustained a significant uh, lower divorce rate than everywhere else in Oregon over the many years since then. They have a great board of directors, people from multiple backgrounds with multiple skills. Um, but Tom and Liz are humble, level five focused leaders, okay? And you, you need to have leadership. Fourth principle um, is be visible once a year with some sort of unifying event. You know, have a family reunion every year, but it's not just internal to get all the different churches and nonprofits and uh, entities involved in your community marriage initiative or the marriage agreement itself, which is a subcategory of it. Uh, you don't just want to get together just for you know, the family picnic, but you want a community celebration that invites more people in and shows that A, there's unity and passion and commitment to this issue, and B, hopefully in some of the messages to the media, uh, there's hope for marriages. A group of people are getting together again to, to talk about preparing marriage as well, or renewing marriage vows, or celebrating marriage enrichment and saying, this is the biggest investment we can ever make. Um, so at least one event a year. And it's great to combine your um, community marriage agreement signing for the very first time, or maybe a re-signing five years later, because half the pastors have resigned by that point because they're getting burned out, or 10 years later, because it needs to be shown that it's still alive, um, hold the signing or the re-signing multiple times around some festival or some carnival or some traditional community activity that's already happening. So you're kind of piggybacking on the community coming together and you just fold it in uh, and the news covers it that, oh, this marriage thing is a part of, uh, you know, Spokane days or whatever it is. Um, so hold a unifying event every year, something to uplift marriages and, and add to unity and project unity and project the positivity of marriage, the hope of marriage to the community through media and word of mouth. Fifth principle, um, I just covered it. It's basically fuel synergy on a proven community event. Look for what's already working in the community. Look for what already has kind of a media footprint. Look for some uh, celebration or festival that the community really enjoys and tie into that. But you want to kind of go know a few of those people and see if that you can create some of the synergies and leverage with them. Okay. Uh, so tag it on, make it seem like just this is a natural part of our community. We do our Fourth of July celebration, and we celebrate marriage every year, that kind of thing, all right? How about if I stop there, and Katie, you can uh, ask me questions for the last couple of minutes. That sounds wonderful, thank you, Jeff. And, and actually, I wanted to see, um, Just I'm just gonna to provide a few closing comments, and then um, I was gonna see if both you and Sheila would stick on for maybe a few minutes, and then we'll open it up to our audience. And yeah, let me ask just you put questions. in a, a footnote before I finish. Okay. Uh, we did a ton of prepare and rich training to prepare marriage preparers and marriage mentors. So Luke Nelson was training more people than anywhere in the country, and he was a part of Stronger Families, and he went all out, and he would do the equipping 
okay, in addition to coaching them on the agreements. And there were 45 of these community marriage agreements um, during that 15 to 20 year uh, period that uh, we were working. Today, Stronger Families is focused solely on military marriages and first responder marriages. Uh, I left, we went through a crisis, the blitz uh, of finances in 2008 and nine uh, set me free to go do fatherhood and, and men's ministry at Men Huddle. I worked for Family Life for five years um, on the national scale. And it also set the organization free to let go of some of the former things I did, not I, but with my direction we did, and to focus on what God had for the future, which was military and first responder, direct service, uh, oxygen for your relationships. And you may say, oh, it's sad they don't have community marriage agreements anymore. Um, yes, they do. And oh, it's sad that they don't have an organization organizing them. Yes, they do. The marriage initiative, it's you guys. As this grows, Carl and the team can go anywhere in the country um, and make it keep happening. So in God's plan, we didn't need stronger families to do this anymore. You guys are going to do it in your community. And Carl and Sheila and the team are going to spread it everywhere else. So, hey, guess what? God's smarter than us. And fascinatingly, Noel Metter and the Stronger Families team, they're four times the size. They're in 40 states now, four zero, not three states. And they are reaching some of the most under stress, underappreciated and damaged marriages out there, first responders and particularly military. If they make it and can help others, that can ripple and help others. So uh, God had a better strategy than we. And the 2008-9 uh, economic crunch was a blitz that he used for good. Well, thank you, Jeff, and especially for your vision and direction on your five principles for creating and, and supporting a CMI community marriage initiative. And I, I believe Carl posted in our in our messages if anyone wants to 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 copy and paste those those um, five principles. And also, I wanted to remind the audience that um, when I sent out the agenda, Jeff had sent to us. Um, a PDF on men's huddle that, that you men and can can share and, and use in churches and small groups. Is this that is something it is. that it's a, it's a little skinny playbook for deep men's friendship in an age of isolation? And uh it's I think it's the way of Jesus is one or two deep friends meeting every week. So they can get it for free and spread it. A to yourself, because men need it leaders and B to any guys you're helping. Wonderful. So yes, we, we did we did send that out and feel free to to use it and, and share it with others. And I just want to thank you again, Jeff, and, and also Sheila for being here with us today and, and sharing your wisdom. I know that um, you know we appreciate you and our CMIs appreciate you. And again, we just thank you for taking the time to, to join us here today. And as I mentioned, we, we will have a brief session with both Jeff and Sheila following the call where you guys can can uh, ask questions and have them answer if you if you have the time. And as you guys know, our hope is always that our training events provide value and insight for our partner cities. So if you have any feedback, good or bad, please let us know. Um, or if there's any way that Marriage Initiative can help support you and your community marriage initiative, your CMI team, please feel free to reach out to me directly at sammy.katyray at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to, to start a conversation with you. And lastly, I wanted to make an announcement and let you all know that in January, we will have Brad Wilcox joining us to speak. So make sure you join us back here next month. And with that, I will say goodbye. And we hope that everyone has a blessed and Merry Christmas. So we'll see you all back here in January. And for those of us who, who are planning to attend the Q&A, if you could stick around. And what we usually do is just go around our virtual room. And if you could raise your hand um, virtually, uh, or you can hold it up. But if you don't want to hold up your hand the whole time, you can just raise it virtually on your screen. And I'll go around the room until we get to, to all of the questions. So if you have any questions for, for Jeff and Sheila, uh, just raise your hand and we will get to your question. So let me just pull up to see. Let's see. Our participants have any hands raised? I have a question for Carl. What's okay. and Sheila? What's the future of um, National Marriage Week, and how excited should we be? 
Well, I'll speak to that first. And just to say that um, we we love the DNA of National Marriage Week and and what and how it was created. And our team wants to come around this incredible uh, yearly celebration and we want to carry that forward consistently. So we, we want to really just uh, focus on all the strong points of what have been created and just uh, and just take it to the next level. Sheila, what, what are your, some of your thoughts? I'm, I'm very excited um, that this team is taking it because uh, they have 14 team members. And when you have that many people with specialties, then you can, you can get a lot more done. You know, so you got a specialist who's creative with social media and another specialist who's creative with writing uh, or creating content on blogs and commentaries. And you can use that content and they have all these talented people. So um, I, it's, I think this is, now I will say that because they're only, somebody's making noise, <laughs> because they're only uh, five, five weeks, you know, from, from New Year's, um, there will be a limited amount that can get done this year. But I think if we can just hold the course, then um, throughout the next 12 months, there will be some very exciting ideas. Yeah, I, I agree, Sheila. And, and when I think of National Marriage Week, it is such a beautiful fit to what's already happening because uh, everything that I see that's happening is what I call mutually supportive. Uh, we have all these dynamic leaders in communities around the country. And that, as Jeff said, is absolutely essential because uh, people uh, who can best move forward are people that are closest to their problems and know best how to overcome them. So we love the value of these local teams and the brilliant dynamic leaders that exist there. But National Marriage Week gives us a place to come together uh, all around the country. And, and so it's mutually supportive. And uh, so one thing that we don't always talk about is we also have another project called our National Leader Project, where we're interviewing all of the best in class content creators around marriage. We did 70 interviews this year. Amy Morgan, uh, I'm not sure if she's still on our call. She's She's uh, there. She has waved. Uh, so Amy is our feature writer and our interview host. And uh, and so th it, there's a beautiful symbiotic way that all these things work together, where you bring together all of our national leaders, you you bring together our local leaders, and then you find a way for them all to connect. And National Marriage Week does a beautiful job of connecting and bringing those pieces together. So we're so excited. We feel so honored. Uh, we're going to keep the character and the DNA of National Marriage Week the same because we believe what's been created is is a really strong process. And so our team's going to get behind this and help move it forward. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Wonderful. It looks like we have a few hand, hands raised, and I think that Jamie and John were first with, with Edge Ministry. So if you guys want to go ahead and ask your question. So I'm, I'm just curious. I have a, a men's group looking at the men's huddle thing. I've had have a men's group that's been meeting for several years now, and it's it's a small group. And I was just wondering what can I do to take that to the next level to affect more of the marriages in that group and, and reach even outside of that group? What would you recommend? Are your are your uh, men's groups six, seven, eight, ten guys? How many? Um, we have a core group of about five and then probably five that join regularly, depending, and we meet weekly at six o'clock. Cool. So uh, my reminder to folks is that Jesus had Peter, James, and John as his inner huddle. Um, and you can't have five, six, seven, eight, ten, and of course you can't have 4,000 Facebook best deepest friends. Uh, you can have 10, 20, 50 really good friends who you open up with and share with, but you can't share with them every week, even every month. Um, you, but you at least need to have one or two. And I think two or three is ideal because the dynamic of three is backed up by Solomon in Ecclesiastes. A triple braided cord is better than two. Uh, and Two personalities encouraging you is better than one. Two personalities seeing your blind spots is better than one. Uh, 
one guy and another guy, they can come, cut each other slack sometimes, whereas a group of three gets to even more shedding of true light. So what I would say is the men huddle questions and ideas and the vision for friendship can assist in your group of five or 10 to help them go deeper and to know how to be more confidential and get over some of the hurdles that stop men from opening up. But the coolest thing that you could do is you could see your guys, each of them develop their own huddle of two best friends and maybe add another guy to that and then show another guy how to do it. And then the DNA in your group of 10 can start to spread outside that circle through the natural nature of <coughs> friendship versus some official group. You know what I mean? So I've kind of given some coaching and, and some playbook and tips, um, three simple questions each week that'll take you as deep as you ever need to go. Um, a couple of principles on how to agree to be a deep friend and, and have a huddle. Um, but eventually it just falls into friendship. The problem is we don't know how to define friendship like Jesus did, um, who made us into his friends and then he made them into friends. Um, so yeah, it can help you as your big group of 10, but more importantly, it'll help each of the guys realize, Hey, one or two of the guys in this group are going to be my best friends, my deepest friends. And maybe it's a guy outside of this group, which would be cool because then he's having that experience with the group at an even deeper level with a guy who's not coming into the group. And then it can start to multiply and spread through your church. What if every church didn't have any men's events or any men ministry, which many don't. And they have no men's budget and no men's pastor, but friendship was rich, thick, and widespread in that church amongst men. I mean, like real friendship. That would change marriages because it would have changed the men and it would definitely change the church. Wonderful. I, I, I think Tom. Hi, Jeff. A couple of questions quick. Now, are you, what's your primary focus now? Is it men's huddle? And then secondly, uh, it's just men one. huddle. I don't have I don't have an S. It's it's the it's the the verb phrase men huddle. Okay. Men get together. Okay. So that's your primary focus, or maybe talk about that. And then secondly, kind of at a bigger strategic level, the relationship between men's ministry and marriage and the importance or the responsibility, I think, for men taking, you know, responsibility in the home and in the broader context. How do you see those two maybe synergism between a men's ministry and the importance of men kind of developing a sense of responsibility overall? Good. I, uh, I think it was Paul who said, hey, I need to be all things to all men that I might win some. He was basically saying, I need to calibrate myself on Mars Hill to these Athenian philosopher thinker dudes. And I need to calibrate myself to, you know, uh, Michael, the super deep Jewish guy. And I need to calibrate myself to uh, Barney, the Gentile, you know, bricklayer. I need to calibrate myself to every type of person so that I can reach them and not make them take a one size fits all approach. Hey, I've got the gospel. Uh, here we go. Hey, marriage is good for everybody. Here we go. H Hebrews 13, four says marriage should be honored among all. So all you men should show up to this men's conference. Come on. No, guess what? You say men's conference, or excuse me, you say marriage conference, you say marriage retreat, you say uh, marriage counseling. Men immediately hear, I have to go and listen to how I suck and how I fail and how I need to be more like my wife, I'm just gonna avoid that one. Now, that's an exaggeration, but, um, and I think we should calibrate some of our men's uh, or our marriage events to make sure they have some masculine advertising, some masculine testimonies, um, something appealing to the man and the husband, why he'd wanna come. Um, it, this isn't to beat you up, this is to build you up. This is about, two people working on themselves individually so they can eventually work on their team together. We need some language that answers some of the questions and the objections that are in our minds ahead of time. Okay, so that's an, a comment about how to advertise marriage events. 
But I think, Tom, if we really want a marriage movement, we have to be all things to all people, which means we need to go up to men directly without their wife in a setting that's manly and to talk about the blueprints and the journey of manhood. Or let's have a, an event at your church called the husband huddle. And only the husbands come. It's man to man talk. Um, we can roll up our sleeves and talk about everything from porn to sex to the way our wife talks to us uh, to passivity. Uh, we can get straight up and we're not going to get beat up. We're going to get called up. So I think we do much better if we held a bunch more husband training. And frankly, I think we'd do well if we did some separate wife training. Because there's messages to the wives that the men shouldn't hear. Or they'll sit back like consumers and wait for the wife to do that. Which is exactly how our culture totally screwed up the submit thing. Men heard that word, said, I'm the leader of the house. Let me teach you how to submit. And I'm going to sit here and wait until you submit. You know, that's the exaggerated patriarchal uh, characterization that the culture chases us away from the Bible with. Um, the word submit is a good word because it's a God word. A good helper. The word helper is a, a good word because it's a Holy Spirit's a helper. It's a good word. We're the ones who messed up those words. And you can't teach it well to men and women at the same time. Don't teach men that wives are to submit. We are absolute selfish consumers who will sit back and say, okay, that's what I deserve. You need to get husbands together and say, dude, you need to submit to Jesus. And you need to submit to one another, as Paul says in Ephesians 5.21. And you need to submit to your brothers who can call you out and help you be a better husband, not someone who will say, yeah, I, I wouldn't take that from her either. That's not a friend. You need a friend of your marriage, dude not just a friend of yourself. So you can do that, Tom, in a husband huddle, a husband's event, a husband retreat, a husband night, a husband coaching session. Use language and colors and advertising and print that's masculine and be all things to all people that you might change some marriages. So same thing, get some wives together for a wives session and don't let us husbands come to it. So I think the, the focus on husbands is crucial. Secondly, the men's movement and the fatherhood movement definitely need to tie in marriage because a man was not made for lone rangering and a man has a sex desire in 95% of the cases and he's going to end up connecting with a girl and he wants to have a successful relationship. So whether he's single right now, divorced, screwing around, addicted to porn, um, messing himself up, um, He's not happy. And the thing that will make him happy is channeling his sex drive towards one woman and having a legacy with a wife and kids and grandkids that doesn't blow up. So we should paint some of that picture to the single men and even the divorced men. And so men's conferences and fathering conferences need to talk about that. Fathering conferences need to talk about, you need to give your kids a reason to say no to porn and and promiscuity and sex outside of marriage um, much better than just no don't do it the bible says it's wrong that's like going in the huddle and saying okay it's third and eight we need this first down don't screw up no fumbles no penalties no mistakes okay ready break you go to the line of scrimmage no one knows what's the play what's the play what are we going to do come on tell us give them the vision the reason they say no is because there's a better yes It's intimacy like God intended with us, with one woman for a life, where you can learn to be good at sex over the next 40 years, instead of practicing with some wrong people now that makes you jealous in the future. Let's say that to men. And so I say, Tom, let's make the fathering movement about painting the picture of our marriage to give them a reason to choose God's path. And let's make men's conferences talk about relationships, dating, your attitudes towards sex, the objectification of women, and your consumer attitude that's being tweaked by your brain being rewired by all those advertising and all the sexual imagery and all the porn, um, and that you need to escape that so you can be ready to be a great husband. Because all the research shows that the happiest men and women are those in a lifelong monogamous marriage with Jesus helping them out. 
So let's use a little research there rather than just the Bible. Use research to prove the outcomes. So yeah, I think, you're, I think your point, Tom, is that the men's movement, the fathering movement has to include marriage. It's the future vision. And I, I'm a little bit more than slightly passionate about this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I just had one of our CME team members message me and say, I am so glad we are recording this. And I, actually, are we, I'm, I, now I'm wondering if, hopefully we're, yes, we are still recording it. Okay, good. And I agreed with her. This, that was amazing. Okay. Uh, I know we don't have a ton of time left, ton of time left, but I think we have one more question from Dennis Stoika. So Dennis, go ahead. Great. So first of all, Jeff, uh, good to see you again. It's been a number of years, but it's uh, I've always been a big fan of yours. Uh, nice person, buddy. She, you're a, you're a, you're a uh, entrepreneur for the marriage kingdom under the kingdom of God. We appreciate you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Sheila. It was a delight to hear from you as well, and 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 just glad to hear just so much that you've you've still got that passion and and my deepest condolence of, to the loss of of, of your husband. Uh, my question is for Jeff. Um, Jeff, you mentioned the four uh, patterns that you had of uh, the community marriage agreements. Uh, oh, four patterns, yeah. Four patterns. I'm wondering if if you, I know it's been a while since you've been with, uh, I was thinking organization is Families Northwest, but Stronger Families. Um, I changed the you, name every three years, Dennis, because I'm kind of ADD, ENFP. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. Fair enough. Fair enough. And of course, we've uh, we've worked with uh, some of your friends, uh, Jason Krafsky with uh, CHMC. As well as, yeah, and Luke. Absolutely. Uh, actually, my direct question is, do, do you still have copies of those four sample templates that might be available to some of us to be interested? Go to Luke. Uh, okay. You're asking a question for the center on the team and I'm the quarterback. So uh, go to the go to the go to the real smart guy. Um, Luke or, or Jason, and they may have more versions today, but uh, I'm sure Luke can help you find out what were the four um, yeah. models of a community marriage agreement that we gave yes. them as templates to get started. And again, Dennis, what they came up with wasn't A, B, C, or D. Yeah. It was E, which was an amalgamum of those. They took and picked and chose and adjusted and added their own components. And Obviously, some communities worked less well and some worked better. And yes. sometimes it was because the community and the degree of leadership. And other times it might have been that the agreement uh, was lacking some teeth. Or that the leadership was too one size fits all and asked for too much and didn't get enough people involved. So um, God really needs to guide the team to their best solution, but it does help to, to have some, uh, you know, model to throw on the wall to start with. I Absolutely. Ask Nelson, that question. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. And I hope you all have a blessed and Merry Christmas and we'll see you back here next year. Bye-bye.
are there any final questions before we sign off today? No, I think that was all. And Jeff, um, if you could stick on for just a minute, I think with you right before the, the next taping, if that's okay. 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 Carl, would you like to uh, close us in prayer today? I would be honored to. Thank you, Sheila, so much for uh, for being with us today and sharing just those many, many years of great principles you, you've learned. And thank you, Jeff, uh, for the same thing. We've heard a lot of great wisdom today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to come together to be a part of what you are doing. And we're just so excited how you're moving all around the country and uh, and you're raising up leaders and uh, you're showing the way forward. And I, I just thank you for Sheila and Jeff and just for their decades of, of experience and faithfulness and that they're willing to show these things to us. Lord, just uh, show us the way forward. Guide us forward as we move from here and uh, demonstrate what it is that you would have us to do each in our own community the way that we would do it, how we would do it, but in all those cases, in a way that would honor you. And so we just thank you again for this day and our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Carl, and all of you people for investing your time. Thanks for what